Sergeant Bill Boots Betridge, Canadian Army, World War II. Bill is one of my Canadian veterans and I'm happy to share his story with you today. Great story folks, we have a lot of great American stories. The Canadians were right there with us in World War II. Uh, Bill actually joined the Lawrence Scots when he enlisted in the Army in 1940 and then ended up being in the Queen's Own Rifles, 8th Brigade, 3rd Division, was actually a sniper over on D-Day, Company A, and just has an amazing story, a great perspective of World War II. All of you out there that like watching the World War II sh videos, all the videos are great, folks. And uh, Bill, I interviewed him and I was in uh, Toronto, Ontario. It was July 17, 2007, 15, 16, 16 years ago now, folks. And Bill's gone. He passed away in 2012, but his story lives on. Just a great man, just a highly decorated man. Fought in D-Day on Juneau Beach with the Canadians, went through Holland and Belgium, Germany, and just came out. He survived. And he tells a story uh, here on the Voices of History YouTube channel. I want to thank Chris Jansen. Chris is a tr Canadian truck driver. Thank you, Chris. I know you're up there driving. He drives for a food chain up there. And he's a supporter of my work. And I'm really grateful, Chris, for you to, to sponsor another story. It's just been a blessing that helped me educate our audience out there about the Canadians' involvement and their achievements of World War II. Folks, a lot of times the Canadians felt overshadowed and left out of history because of the American victories. But like I said, they are right there with us. And I've featured a few Canadian stories. I have many more. So if you're a Canadian viewer or listener out there on the radio station, Please, please consider becoming a sponsor of one of these many stories or donating to my work too, folks. Uh, it, there's information in the comment section of this video and there's information to sponsor a video on the website, uh, larrycapetto.com, to sponsor a vet, click on it or in the video description of this video. So, but Okay, once again, Chris, I wanna thank you for your help in helping me to share this story and uh, it's good talking with you and staying in touch with you. Folks, 9-11 um, anniversary is coming up on Monday. It'll be September 11th in a few days. And I have a film that I produced called 9-11 Remembered, A Day of Infamy. It's a two and a half hour gripping, gripping film like the Holocaust. Folks, our country is famous for forgetting. That's why I call my documentary series, Lest They Be Forgotten. It's an afterthought. If we don't remember, we're going to forget. So I don't want us to forget 9-11. It's been 22 years now. And some people treat it like, eh, no, not eh, and we're not going to erase the history of what happened. It was a war zone there that day. And I've got people that were trapped in the towers, the civilians that survived. I have fire, EMS, um, paramedics, Port Authority, police, and of course the fire department in New York was there and all kinds of volunteers and so many people just came into the area to help out. So I'm going to feature one or two of the stories, complete stories before Monday. And I'm thinking about sharing my complete film with you on Monday. So if you think that's a good idea, um, let me know. But I, I really want to share the whole film. I have an hour edit version that's popular on my YouTube channel. Um, I, I may put the link in my uh, video description, but I'd like to share the entire story. It's close to my heart. I've lost two of my survivors from that time. And uh, that's, this, that's the part of the story we don't hear about, the aftermath of what happened. So it was an outright attack. It was a war. And that's how I see it, and that's how those that were there see it. So, okay, a little bit about 9 11, remember. So, enjoy Bill Betridge's story, his nickname Boots, and I miss him, and like all my Canadian veterans, and I'm happy to share it with you today. They'll be on my Voices of History radio channel, too, for you to listen to, which is going wonderful over here. And I just, it all works together, folks. These stories, history is best learned from those who were there. So, Okay, thanks for sharing these stories and subscribing to the channel. I, get, I present to you Bill Petridge. Eighty-six and a half. What year did you join the military? Uh, Forty-one. Okay, and how old were you then? Forty-one, I'd be about a little over eighteen. 
Why did you join the military? Well, I actually tried to get into the Air Force. Uh, I grew up with an uncle who was uh, just just a few years older than me. We were great friends through the years, and he was well educated, much more than me. And they wouldn't take me, so he didn't join. So I come back to Brampton and find all my buddies that I grew up with and join the Queen's Own Rifles. So I go back to Toronto to join the Queen's Own Rifles, and they're filled up. They're pretty fussy them days. So I come back to Brampton, and I wasn't going to be beat. I joined right down at the Brampton Legion, the Lawrence Scots. So at this time, the Queen's Own were in uh, Newfoundland guarding the Gander Airport. And after a, a, a stay there, they come back to Sussex, New Brunswick, and I transferred from the Horn Scots to Sussex, New Brunswick, to be with the, the few Brampton guys that I knew in the Queen's Own. Now, you were in the Army? Canadian Army? Oh, yeah. Okay. This is the Canadian Army, the Queen's Own Rifles, the 8th Brigade of the 3rd Division. And what was your rank at that time? I was a private when we landed and a sergeant when we came out. Okay. Um, 1941. Um, when did you go to Europe then? Right after your training initially, or? Well, we well, got to, uh, <clears throat> I got to England in 42, and we spent four years in England guarding the shores, the south of England and the southeast. Uh, and uh, we took turns. There's was, there was a lot more Canadians than the Queen's Own Rifles there. And then when we weren't doing that, we were being trained. And as the war progressed, as going on now, we could see that. All our training is based on assault training. You had to walk, thir be able to walk 30 miles in a day with all your stuff. In case you're in inland when the attack, German attack comes, you had to be within a day's walk, and you had to carry everything and take turns carrying the anti-tank guns. So you, you were in damn good condition. When a couple of guys get monkeying around in the tent or in the old Nissen huts, arguing a little bit, some guy'd say, ah, wait till the old BB comes and see how smart you are. And we, the BB meant the bloodbath. That's because we were, knew we were pretty well slated for this because the first div was in Italy, Sicily. The second div got all beat up in the Dieppe Parade in 1942, so we knew we were the guys. Now, you weren't at the Dieppe Parade? No. Okay. I, I was there, I got a picture of, of some survivors coming back from that attack. And it, there's three groups out in the front of this picture this journalist took. One looked like me. And I guess, the, you know, the word goes around and the next thing you know, it's printed in the Brampton paper. They got a Golden Mail copy, put it in the, in the Brampton paper saying it was me. Oh so the parcels were coming in. My dad sent me a nice letter. And all this proud he was, and I wasn't even there. <laughs> But I was with the troops that took Dieppe from the rear. Okay. So I know a bit about Dieppe. Okay. Well, can you tell me just historically a little bit about the Dieppe raid, what the objective was, and, and the, the casualties well, that were suffered there? The, the, the objective was to, to see if we get a foothold. And it, it was called a raid. It, it, I don't think they, I really don't think they thought they could stay there because. If you could see uh, some pictures I have, I have quite a big album of, of war stuff. The, the beach, the cliffs overlooking the beach, you, they didn't have a chance. And, and the beach is all like cobblestones, not sand. Mm -hmm. And so tanks had no traction, you know. It was a real tough battle. What was the objective? Was it to, to try to simulate uh, a landing? Well, the I, I think it was, they, they say it was to get experience for the real the real thing. And they had, uh, 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 I can't recall the fellow's name, but they had a spy, a double agent. The Germans thought he was working for them and uh, he was really working for England. And what he did, he wasn't smart cookie, it's quite a story. What he did was had imitation tanks made out of rubber, like a rubber dinghy and that, in the shape of a tank, and massed them over in the Dover side of the of the channel and airplanes, fields of these dummy airplanes, and then he got a double for George Patton, the American general, and had his presence known, and the Germans thought that's where we we're going to land, over in the Calais. And they, they were so bent on that's where the, they knew they were going to be attacked someday. 
And they were bent on preparing all their backup troops there. Well, as it turned out, we, we didn't land there. We went, I don't know how they didn't detect us. Out all that time in that channel, way down to, to around the south, southeast corner of France. And then how they didn't get detected, I don't know. The, the Depp raid, one of the, one of the big failures of Depp, there happened to be a German patrol boat going through the English Channel and spotted the going. So the Germans were sitting there waiting for them. But they didn't know, they weren't waiting for us. We, we caught them by surprise. It was real fortunate. Now, the only tough part of it was it was rough water. They had waterproof their tanks and then they attached canvas tarp around it five or six feet high and on the top was uh, a bells of some kind like a big tube running around so the idea was when the tank ran off the ramp out, out at sea it hadn't gone to the beach yet it was sink down but not to the dis distance of that tarp going up the side because as soon as they hit the water, them ballast things come to the top. But that didn't work because the sea was so rough, half them went down and stayed down. The idea of them guys, they had, it's like about three 45-gallon drum, drum on the front of their tank with two big extensions. And that had great big logging chains attached to it, and it rotated. And their job was to run across the beach in their tank and slam hell out of, the, out of the sand, hoping they could explode a mine, enough force. They were to go up to the wall, jump out of the tank, and we had a kind of a sticky bomb, they called it. You peer, peel the shell off and whack the wall with it, and it stays there, and you got about five seconds to get back into the tank and get out of the way. Well, they landed behind us. <laughs> they find those that survived landed behind us, but this time, we're over the wall, and once you get over the wall, it's a bit of a gully there, and then there's a railway track running parallel with the wall. But you had a little protection there, so we thought, except that machine gun could get you from that bunker, eh? Then the, the railway tracks, we had the next move was to make a dash over the railway tracks. But this time, the tanks had landed, and to bring their fire down to an effectiveness, on to hit the, the buildings that were lined with cement and stuff like that. They had to skin the wall and the railway tracks to get their fire down low enough. And every now and then, one of the guys would run up to, to, over the hill, and my buddy Shepard say, Boots, that's my nickname, he, he says, Great thing, wait till that tank stops firing. He's hitting our own guys because they don't know that it's just skinning the wall, which puts us in the line of fire. So uh, that, uh, I don't know how many they got, but they certainly got some of our own guys. So we got across the beach, over the wall, over, and then getting over the tracks. Now we got the wire to contend with. Let me, let me ask you a question. Um, we're going to kind of jump around here a little bit. Yeah. But um, you mentioned uh, the preparation for D-Day. Before D-Day, did you know what D-Day was? Uh, how, how, what kind of information did you have before you guys went off and did you land on D-Day June 6th? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like the night before were you at Southampton, Plymouth, where were you at? Were you on a, were you on a ship out in sea? No, no, we were at a uh, deserted uh, British uh, army camp okay. and they had the British guards around it because now we're working with the intelligence people. We don't know where we're landing but we know we're going someplace over there. And so they had sand tables set up with a duplicate of the beach where we to, were to land. And I thought, I really thought this is going to be an easy touch. It just built my confidence. Maybe this was the, the idea, because it turned out I was wrong. But to build up our confidence or something that looked so easy, they would say things like, you know, that house, they pointed it on the sand table. That house, they had two machine guns in there yesterday, but they've taken one out and they've moved it over to here, stuff like that. We thought, oh boy, this is going to be a snap, eh? But... Unfortunately, the weather turned rough, just about including myself. We were sick as dogs. We, we were issued plastic bags to, to vomit in. 
And I was really sick. I don't think I really cared too much what happened when I landed on that beach. But I, this, uh, my job on the master plan, on the sand table, was to shoot at the opening in this pillbox, they call it. A pillbox is like a big dome with slots for you to shoot at it. But this is like a, a self-serve restaurant. The whole side was open. They got a cannon in there and a machine gun. The machine gun was to sweep the beach, and the bunker was to sweep anybody that got up to the wall or behind the wall. They had it pretty well. That Rommel had, he had stuff figured out pretty darn good. Tell me about the actual morning of the landing. What, did you get up early? Did you have a last meal? And then tell me about the getting into the boats and then the rides ashore. Yeah, we got in the big ship uh, the night before. We were out. We arrived, I don't know, two or three miles off the shore. And then they had rope ladders. They dropped down the side of the, of the big ship because we're in the big ship in hammocks and that. We had breakfast in the morning. Those that could eat, most of them were too excited and stomach turned up. But you can understand a rope ladder hanging over the side of a ship. When the ship and the rough water went like that, the ladder stayed straight. And so then you had to be lucky to get into the assault boat, not stand between the assault boat and the, and the ship. So anyway, then we were supposed to land about 7.30 in the morning, it was through the schedule, but in the effort of getting everybody in the assault boats, like there's 10 of us assault boats going in, in line. So the first ones to get loaded up were circling around out in the channel waiting for everybody to get off so we could go in as a line. Now my job was to shoot at this, this so-called pillbox, which was an impossibility because I'd have to be shooting through my own, my own guys. There's a lot of guys on my left and a lot of guys on my right. I'm only concerned with that space in front of me because George, I've been training with him for five years. I got more faith in him and I'm not, I'm not worried about over there. Georgia get that and Ann get that. I'm only concerned about getting off this off this beach. Well tell me now, did, the actual landing on Juno Beach, I mean you're going in the morning of June 6th, are the Germans firing at you or would you yeah. tell me about when you first noticed the firing and is this your first time in combat? Oh yeah. This is first so, combat. So do you feel like you're invincible, like nothing can happen to you, and then when the bullets start flying, well, you grow up? A lot of people, I've heard people being interviewed and said anybody says they weren't scared is, wasn't really in the action. But I don't feel I was scared. I, I was amazed. I couldn't believe what was happening. I was in awe what was happening. But you couldn't be scared. You couldn't muckle up your mind by being scared. You had to keep going. You had to get over that wall. That's the first thing, to get over that wall. I'll tell you, I was scared many times later, but on that morning, I can't say I was scared. I'm more interested in getting over that wall and finding somebody to shoot at. How about the mood of the troops? Are you guys apprehensive? Or are you oh, I'm very, very apprehensive. We, we couldn't believe what was happening. Boats of all sizes, as far as you could see. And the only time you could see them is when you come up out of the swell and you're mounting a swell and you'll see all these damn boats. And then when you go down, all you see is water. That's how rough it was, it was very rough. And seasick, oh, terrible. What kind of landing craft were they? I know the Americans had like Higgins boats. Uh, you had some type of... Uh... It, it, it was just a cheap, cheap boat with a big door that falls down in front. And thinking over this, you know, you second thought. If they had, if they had a, the intelligence had it taken an airfoil with a, one of them mosquitoes that fly a mile a minute, a lot faster than that, looking so we could see that opening there, you'd have been able to better prepare for it. But looking down from the top, they call it a pillbox, but there's no way I could shoot at that, even if I had a machine gun. But if one, if maybe two boats were ahead of everybody, because you can't have a uh, hundred guys in a line at the same time, and you're shooting through them, the same level, the, the things on the beach, and we're on the beach. 
you couldn't you couldn't shoot at it. But if you had two assault boats go ahead, well, even in rough water, you couldn't miss a target. This this opening is about three foot. I've measured it since. It's about three foot high and about eight feet wide. You couldn't miss that if you had a had a, a belt fed machine gun on the side of the boat so you wouldn't interfere with the landing and keep their heads down till the boys could get up and throw grenades in, in the thing. That would have been the ideal thing. Well, that was a question I had. When you, when you landed now, the, did the ramp go down and then you all run out and were the Germans shooting at you? The, the, the training was, as soon as that ramp down, there's three rows, three rows of seats, benches. Uh, an English, an English uh, Navy guy was driving the boat. The motor was at the back. He was at the back. And when the thing went down, so he drove right up the beach as far as he can go. The odd one got racked up in the, in the underwater obstacles, say, eh? because we landed at high water mark so we wouldn't have too much beach to run across, say, eh? because it's quite a big beach when the water's down. So several boats got hung up. It's, it just ruined the formation as we're going in. Some, some guys had to jump out and swim. Some guys was just, just a real mess. But yes, they were shooting. They had a machine gun that looked like a manhole in front of the wall with one of their MG42s have a, a really, I can't, I, I can't recall the firing rate, but it, when they fired, it sounded like a motorcycle going off. If you get hit with one bullet, you got hit with two or three. I, I could tell you more about that later. So I keep getting off the track. You're okay. You're doing good, Bill. Well, now tell me, when you landed, um, what's your objective? And also, um, are you losing? Okay. Are you losing your buddies on your okay. left and your right? Tell me about the casualties. Yeah. Well, as a, as the door went down, the center row was to run off first, then the right, then the left. But it was everybody trying to get off at the same time. And there was three guys carrying a ladder, very, very heavy ladder, to get over the wall. I think, I think the wall was only about six, maybe seven feet high, but the Germans had added that that, that was a seawall, a curved seawall to help make the, the, the waves go back out rather than ruin the, the wall. But the Germans had, I met the guy who was a little boy at the time, helped put stakes in to put wire on top of the wall. So the three guys were just to the right of me, uh, not, I don't know, 10 feet away, because when you step on a mine, the blast goes up. I think, I think, in my opinion, the mines were more in the ground to get the big equipment, not so much for a soldier. One guy don't mean too much like that. And so you, probably a bunch of us stepped on mines and they didn't go off. And together with the fact they'd been in the water for years, they, and they, you know. So, Jesus, we're all hunched over. You know, we're, we don't know what the hell to do. The sand table thing was gone. We're on our own because we had blown about three or four, five hundred yards to the right of the landing where we were queued in on. So we're all on our own. We just on our own. Just our training had to get us through. And our training, it was pretty damn important. And I look back, uh, I'm glad I paid attention to what they were teaching. Because it got me, got me home. But the front guy, those th three fellows carrying the ladder, luckily for him, not, not too luckily, he stepped not on the mine, but the middle guy stepped on the mine. And all he had seen was a, a red mass. He, he just was just skinned alive. Any loose parts were ripped off. I could, I could hear him screaming when he got over the wall. He, it took the guy several minutes to die. Eh? Uh, it, it's a terrible thing. But the other thing was the guy in front of him got shrapnel in his back. And the guy in front of him got shrapnel, just to, because they're only tinny things, just small particles. Now the guy in front that got shrapnel in his back, I went up to visit him in 1952. There's three brothers in the Queen Zone. And then what had happened when they operated to get this shrapnel out of his back, they, they too close to his heart. They couldn't go any farther, eh? So they left him like that. It got worse and worse. And Mother Nature 
as a way of building calcium around a hurt. I've seen that in animals, you know. And it was stopping his heart from expanding. So they had to put him in the hospital and beat away with a hammer and a chisel to get that calcium off. And of course, that's a big thing. It wasn't all done and they had to put him back together and wait a few months and do him over again. And uh, I think about six months later, we had a fellow win the Victoria Cross and we we're having a presentation. They were naming the, uh, uh, a bridge over the Ottawa River in a little hamlet called Latchford, where this fellow was born. And this fellow that's got all the wounded, had the trouble in all these operations. His wife was just a little community, and they had a big army marquee tent. They didn't have a town hall and all that stuff in this little town. And I heard this voice saying, does anybody know Bill Bettridge? Bet, 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 she couldn't quite get my spelling. And I recognized her because I'd sent, been seen them in 52. And I went out, hi, I'm Murray. I said, oh, Bill, see Alex out in the car, but he can't get out. Is there any of the boys here he'd know? He'd like to see them. So I did find a half a dozen guys that he knew. We went out and conversed with them a little bit, and, and he died two weeks later. Now, when you guys hit Juno Beach, you said you're on your own, your training kicked into gear. Um, did you take out the German pillboxes and did you just start moving inland? This walk me through a little bit more detail. Well, what the Germans had, this, this bunker, the opening on the bunker was designed so they could shoot along the beach, not out to sea. And so the, the big... Maybe a battleship hit it dead on might hurt it, but four feet of concrete is pretty hard mass to move. And so they were pretty safe from... And then the machine gun, maybe 50 yards down the beach, is stopping anybody from running up, putting grenades into their bunker. So it wasn't until luckily somebody got the guy in the, in the machine gun nest, now, now they're vulnerable. Yeah, the, because they're opening us to, along the beach, they're vulnerable now because they can't see straight out. So they just have to run up and drop the machine guns. This all was over with within a minute, minute and a half, two minutes. What kind of rifle do you have? We had a regular Lee Enfield rifle, but it was one picked out of uh, the best of woodwork and the best of everything. And then they added the necessary parts to put the telescope sight on it. We didn't get them telescope sights in training until 1943. We were using a, a, a British uh, Ross rifle as a sniper rifle. It's a very good rifle, but it couldn't take the dirt and rough stuff. So to tell me more about the convoy that morning. You said you saw the ships as the swells would come up, and, and it, was a, it was a mighty force. I mean, thousands of ships out there. Is that something you used to remember, or does it seem like a fading memory? Well, uh, uh, once we landed, never looked back. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you much about what was going on behind me. But, uh, well, they say 15,000 yeah. Canadians landed on Juno Beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, were there many casualties? Well, uh, on the initial assault, of course, the, the, you see, see there's four, four fighting companies in a regiment, and there was two companies, there was only two A and B companies. C and D were sitting out in the channel waiting for us to clear the beach. Now, I can understand them being scared because they're seeing the guys falling over, right? but I don't know what's going on behind me. So, once, I don't know, it was the troops to my left that killed this machine gun, which made it easy for the guys to run up and, and put the grenades in, but, but by this time we're over the wall and the track and we're down to the wire. And uh, other than the latter, I only had only seen one guy fall, and he was a big Indian. He had shoulders as, as, as choices. He wouldn't let anybody carry. He was a machine gunner, a Bren gun. He wouldn't let nobody carry it on the route marches. And he gets off on the beach, and he's like wide up or somebody. And boom, he's dead. And that's the first guy I'd seen killed, just to my left a little bit. What, what goes through your head as a young man at that time? Are you conscious of fighting for your country? Is it a man well, of survival? No, no, no. I don't, tell me about that, combat. That, 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 uh, it's, it's just, I guess it's just, sorry, we call him chief because he was an Indian guy. Sorry, chief. And we were told you don't stop to help anybody no matter what, no matter what happens. You keep going, even if he's just wounded, you don't stop. 
we stop, you're going to be dead. So, no, that, uh, back, it just, I think the thoughts was, well, Jesus, this, we knew we had to do this. And said, Jesus, I'm sorry, Chief, it was you. Went before me. Get me, let's keep going. And, uh, it's got to go. What was the hardest uh, engagement or battle that you had after D-Day as you ensued in, into France? I mean, was there a particular engagement that you, you encountered that was harder well, than the others? Well, uh, of course, we have an objective. Those who landed on D Day had an objective. And ours was some high ground in about six miles, a little hamlet, a little town called Anesty. And Anne Gurney was right close by it. And that was our target to get to that night, it was high ground. And we got there, one of the few assault troops that got to their objective that day. So, uh, but once we got over the wall and through the wire, there's a bit of a story about the wire. I don't know if I should tell you about that or not. I'll tell you about it anyway. Tell me. There, there was, uh, my sniping partner was, uh, we're, we're now up all this pile of Constantino wire, that, that stretchy stuff. Once you cut it, it kind of slings back and leaves a hole. Well, my, my sniping partner, uh, Bert Shepard, on my left, and then me, then a couple of soldiers, and then the uh, company sergeant major. And we had to get through this wire. Now, we're taught to dive over it and scrunch it down with your body, and everybody run over top of you, but we didn't think that's a very good idea. So the sergeant major says, Boots, I'm going to throw these wire cutters to you. You pass more to Shep because it was desirable for cover's sake. The, the old, there was a railway station just over that way. It was better for us to run that way. No use to run on that way than have to run all the way across. So tell them to cut the wire. We'll all make a run for it together. I think there was five, maybe six of us. <laughs> and Shepard heard them. And Shepard says, you tell him he can go first. He's making more money than I am. <laughs> now this Shepard, you have to know him to know he'd say a thing like that with big 16-inch shells going over our heads and the noise and the racket. To say a thing like that gives you an idea. He turned out to be a, a, a he had a French squad gear. He, he didn't care. He spoke what he said. When the commanders say, okay, Shep, I want you to take your men around, go down through that way. The Shep seen a better way. He said, sorry, sir. I think it'd be better if we went down through that. See that gully on the map? We'll go down through that way. He just spoke his mind all the time. He's quite a character. How, how long after D-Day did you go into France and push into Germany eventually? You, were, uh, or you said your objectives and then... Uh, did you get into more, more heavy combat after you got inland? Oh, yeah. We, we see the wheat now. The wheat is three feet high, 24 inches high at that time of the year over there. And the Germans had a habit of taking a, what we call a back hole and digging a trench mm -hmm. that would allow their tanks to drive down in, a slope on one end, so a tank could drive down in there so there's just a turret sticking up. Well, three feet, two, two feet would, I don't think the towers on those tanks are any higher than that. So they can, they, don't forget, they're waiting for us. So they got the advantage. So they, in this one particular case, almost lost a whole company. And uh, I'm, I'm with headquarters company, with the snipers. And I seen the guys going, going into this wheat field. I keep moving here. With guys on top of the tanks, but little did they know that the other side of that wheat field, these guys were just sitting there waiting for the right moment to cut loose. And that was a German SS, 12th SS Division. They're crack troops. Kurt Meyer was the, the general in charge. So then all of a sudden, all, I don't know how many tanks that went in there. They all went by. The guys were riding on tanks. I don't know how many, I guess you can get six or eight guys on top of a tank. And I might have been six or seven or eight tanks, I'm not sure. But they come under fire and boom, boom, boom. Tanks were going up in flames. 
uh, machine guns that cleaned the guys off the tanks. Some were killed, some were wounded. The tanks, uh, I'm, I'm just out, uh, there's a bit of a f farmhouse there with a stone fence around it and we're in the, laying in the ditch uh, outside of the stone fence and one of the tanks come climbed right through the stone fence in his effort to get away from the 88s that were knocking our guys out. So we lost three quarters of D Company that day because why didn't somebody say, let's set fire to that wheat field before we go in there? Things, things you don't think about. So uh, we got beat up pretty good there, had moved back. And the next morning, uh, the Sergeant Major, Charlie Martin, and my sniping partner, Bird Shepard, and I had to patrol this again. And we're the ones that reported uh, I don't know, six or seven guys murdered. So what happened after after we all the rest of the regiment pulled out and the tanks were gone, they come out looking for survivors out of their position. They got nobody fighting against them. We're all moved back. And it, you could see, I remember one guy had his bolt open and his finger on the trigger and a bullet in his head. Another guy was reading a New Testament. We had these little Bibles in our pocket. He was reading that. Another guy had just released the bullet and his, his action was closed so you could tell and every one of them had a hole in the head murdered. So we cut their dog tags off. We're, we're issued with two dog tags in the, in the event a man is killed. Even in the civilians will bury you. You can't leave a man out dead in the hot weather very long and he's a terrible sight. So they would bury them. So there's two dog tags with your identification. So you cut one off and turn it in, but you leave one on the body. And if you're lucky enough to have a blanket, because there is a, a, an army team that digs them up and puts them in a proper cemetery, so a blanket around them kind of helps a bit. So these were your men that were, you say, murdered. Why do you say murdered? Well, because there's a bullet hole in each one of their heads. Executed, yeah. Yeah, executed. What... Bill, as a young man, how, how do you keep your sanity? How do you process well, all this? Is it your training? Do you have faith it, in God? It's, it? It, you, it grows up with your training. I think, I think we know that somebody's going to get... We had a company commander at, at some of the briefings before we go into an attack. He'd say, this is going to be a tough one, fellas. We're, we're going to lose a few of us this time. We knew all this. We knew we were going to somebody. Just hoping it's not you. I don't care about, if, if Jack gets hit, I'm sorry as hell, but it's not me that got hit. I'm still going. Did you encounter the Germans all the way through to the end of the war, or, or what? Yeah, yeah, we, uh, uh, we had a lot of tough times. Uh, Nye Megan, you've heard the movie, The Bridge Too Far. I think that bridge was in Arnhem, and then that, on the Rhine River. That's in Germany, on the Rhine River. And then downstream a bit was Nijmegen. That's on the Dutch side, because that was the border between France and Germany there. <laughs> so, I uh, lost my track again. Well, I'm just asking about the Germans, encountering the Germans uh, all the way through to the end. And, uh, you know, did you have any other major raids or in battles or was it sporadic fire or did you get any major engagements uh, and did you did you push all the way through through Belgium? Well th this this Nijmegen thing I'll, I'll carry on with that Bart because the 82nd American Airborne Divisions dropped to, to get the bridge not at Arnhem I think the movie Bridge Too Far is in in Arnhem but this is Nijmegen downstream and 82nd Airborne Division dropped there, and we were the first ground troops to relieve them. So we kind of slept together overnight for one night. And of course, they got the best spot down in the basement. We got upstairs. But I don't think they were all that well trained because my buddy and I, my sniping partner, were upstairs, and we shook hands with these guys, but they're, going, they're moving out the next day, you know. We got to hold this bridge. So we each had a blanket, and I flatten my blanket out on the floor and my buddy flattens his out on the board and the shot goes out and the blanket goes like that 
the Americans were cleaning this gun down below and it went off. So I'm glad we didn't get into bed too quick. Uh, there was a few words said to them guys. When you're, when you're fighting in, in combat, I mean, do you think about home? Do you think about Canada? I mean, like the Americans, when I ask them, they're, are they no. fighting for their country? Are you fighting no. for your country over there? A uh, 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 a very used way for snipers was when the front troops were advancing. Sooner or later, you come under fire, and down they go. But the sniper travels maybe a hundred yards behind. So, needless to say, the Germans aren't worried about that guy a hundred yards behind. They're worried about them guys up front. That gives the sniper a chance to move fairly freely and get into a position where he can bring fire on the, the Germans that are firing on our guys. And believe me, if a bullet goes by your ear, you don't know whether it's two feet or six inches, and you keep your nose down in the grass, and that's what a, where a sniper comes. He may not necessarily hit the target, he may not even be able to see it, but he sure keeps their heads down so they can move up. And that was one of the well-used ways of using a sniper, not standing out front looking for somebody to shoot at. A guy in England from the First World War sniper, one of his lectures said to me, the best words I ever heard, he said, don't get yourself killed. <laughs> Meaning, what's the use you out in patrol and you got all this information, you've seen a dugout there, you have an 88 there and you've seen this, what's the use of taking all the information you get yourself killed? So information, uh, patrol work was more my job than sniping. Did you, did you realize how large D-Day was at the time, or is it just looking back? I mean, did you know that the Americans were landing, the British, I mean, at the same time? I guess we did, but I can't really remember much about that. I, I don't remember anything knowing about the Americans, but the British were, of course, the Americans were quite a ways from us. The British were right with us. So. Did you see the movie Saving Private Ryan? No, i I, I never never seen that, no. That's um, so, so look, looking back on the war, does it seem like over 60 years ago, Bill, or does it seem like yesterday to you, the memories of that? Well, I've been back there quite a few times. I'm back to the Dutch 50th anniversary. They, they opened their country up first on their 50th anniversary. We had a free pass to go anywhere in Europe for, for three days, like the, the parade procedure and that. That was a big thing. The, the host that looked after me, my nickname was Boots, and as we got to know each other on, on their 50th anniversary, I got to know, and they would phone and say, could I speak to Boots? And so he said, what's this, what's this Boots? So I said, it's just a nickname I got in the Army, Bootless Bill. And so he had a big flagpole, the big Canadian flag in front of his house, and he pulled the thing down and put a, a pair of Army boots and a set of mess tins and attached it to the flag <laughs> and hung it hung it back up just for the joke. But little flags leading to his house, thank you, Mr. Bill Bettridge, our liberator, and all, they just open this, open this, these Canadian flags. If you ever go over to Holland, make sure you got a, a Canadian flag on your shirt. You'll be treated with royalty even 60 years later, really. They just, because they were the last to be liberated. So they starved and they had, they were eating, turnips and bulb roots and anything they could get to eat. They burnt their furniture. It's in one house, didn't stay in the house very often, but at Nijmegen, the Germans at Arnhem were sending anything that would float, boats, docks, anything that would float downstream. We're below, Nijmegen is downstream from uh, Arnhem. With a, with a, a shell of the biggest caliber they could wire onto the side, hoping they'd hit one of the pounds holding the bridge up. And we had a little rowboat. We had to, oh, here comes another one. We'd row out like and had a big long pole and just steered it away from the pilings so, so they couldn't hit the pilings. And then uh, in Nijmegen that year, uh, from there on in, we just patrolled. We were there quite a bit for the winter in the house I was staying in. We, a week in the house and then a week g guarding the bridge and watching this stuff. And they had burnt all their furniture. Can you imagine burning your fried furniture to keep warm? They had nothing. That they, one of the, there were two girls and a mother and a brother. A brother, not far from our age group, a little bit older than us. 
I said, how did you ever escape the work camps and all that? And he says, well, Bill, he says, come here. He lifted the mattress up and he says, one of them old stretchy springs. And so one of the girls would get, lift the mattress and get underneath the mattress and she would countersink herself in that springy thing and put the mattress back on and get in bed and pretend she's sick. Every time there's a house inspector, got them right through the whole war like that. But one of the girls had her legs shattered from shrapnel. So innocent people getting her day. Eh? So I got her to the MO, our medical officer, and got her all fix-ups. I commandeered a, one of the old Coleman pump-up stoves and give to them. And my buddy and I, we piled our mess tins up with food when we, we had a, a place situated in the middle of where all the troops are holed up waiting and coming back and share it on their nice white plates and that. And uh, needless to say, they cried like babies when we left. Uh, they just so thankful. So if you ever go to Holland, boy, have that old maple leaf on there. Were you able to help any of the wounded at the time when you were with them, or was that just the medics that did that? Or um, were you able to help anybody? No, we had a thorough medical team, our medical stretcher bears and that. They were there when you needed they did a terrific job, and they, we we had uh, we had uh, sterilizing powder that we could put on a wound if I come across a guy, and we had uh, this pain killing stuff that, that you take in the full of a form, a form of a tablet we could give to them to help the pain. But you, if you're in action, you, you couldn't stop too long, and depending, you know, where he was hit. Is there another combat story you can relate to me that you have? There's, there's one that uh, I hope I don't get break down on this subject, but it really hurts me even thinking about it. It, it, it was uh, oh, it's too long to tell you the story that led up to this, but one of the guys, he's about 10 years older than us guys. We, we, uh, we had a lot of respect for him. He's married, left home with a little child who I've met since, and... Uh, in one of our counterattacks, I was going along this hedgerow and I run across them. First of all, as when, when you're going into a battle, you just don't go into a battle. You have a starting point. There's already somebody there ahead of you, and they've been patrolling and patrolling and getting all the information they can for those troops that's going to pass through them. So that morning as we're moving up to the starting point, this fellow, his name was Buck Harry Hawkins. I didn't know his name was Harry till I read about him later, but we knew him as Buck Hawkins. He had a, a Bren gun on him. And I said, how are you this morning, Buck? We're just moving into position. And he didn't have his usually high spirits up, you know, as if he knew something was going to happen. So to get on to my story and, and cut out a lot of this stuff, I know you're on a time schedule here. I'd run across him, and he was white as a sheet. Well, I never had a guy die in my arm, so I didn't know nothing about that, eh? But he, he was so far gone, I started ripping his clothes apart to find out where he was hit. And as soon as he felt somebody, he didn't have enough strength to open his eyes. I should have known there's nothing I could do for him. I, I know now. And as soon as I touched him, he said, who's that? I said, Boots. Said, oh, good, he says. Please lift my head. And he took one big breath as if he's waiting for me, uh, for somebody to be with him. And uh, every, every time I think of him, uh, I, I did tear his clothes apart. I couldn't find out where he was hit. I couldn't have done any good for him anyway. If I, I know now. But I, I had a zipper down, a shirt up, I couldn't see. And then I realized he's going that way and the enemy's that way. So I look here and he's got three blue marks, all within a group. Like I tell you, you get hit with one, you get hit with more. And I look over this side and there's one sticking out because I had a pair of pliers with me for checking my sight. And I pulled that out, and no, not, not even any blood to come out. He, he just tore him apart, and he just bled to death. So he he would have, wouldn't have had no pain or anything. He just died. I met his uh, daughter. Uh, they had a, they named a street after him in the south of France, uh, in his in his name. But uh, well, <laughs> I uh, he he must have passed 
within a few feet of me. When we come under fire, I, I heard the company commander. He's just behind me to my left, and my partner, he's behind me. I'm the point guy, and we're going down this long, slopey field. This grass is quite high, high enough to hide you, but uh, the company commander's radio man's one of these big 18 sets, I think they call them, on his back, which did put him a guard. And I heard him say, get rid of that goddamn radio. You're drawing fire. And the bullets are flying around. We had a shovel. And they're, 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 we're hitting troops now that were not experienced because they, were, they cut loose with us and there must have been a thousand yards away. It was ridiculous. They had a waiter. They had got, got us all. And they're only shooting by chance because once we go down the grass, they, they're just spraying everything they can. And we had a shovel with us because it, it was just getting into the afternoon now. And when we get to our objective, we're going to dig in. That's the procedure, dig in. And so all this firing going on, and Jesus, I, pss, pss, pss. I thought, I put my rifle butt ahead of me, my tin hat's on. I put my tin, uh, uh, my shovel ahead of me, and I thought if they hit me dead on, by the time it goes through the shovel, the rifle butt, and my helmet, I may survive. But I couldn't stand that. I couldn't stand that. And I thought if I just run towards the enemy, about 50 yards, I would guess it was, there's a little side road. Like every side road, there's little trees and big trees and all kinds of brush and stuff. If I can get down there, and I always remember the farmer's outside furrow was a bit of a ditch. If I can get down there, I might have a bit of cover. I might have a chance. So as you, as you can see, I'm here. So I got down to there. I got into this little outside furrow of a plowed field, but it wasn't big and deep enough to submerse me. And we had commando knives issued, and I had my commando knife trying to make it deeper when I heard a kapow, a mortar bomb, hit to the right of me. To the right of me was a railway track running parallel with my direction of travel. And I think there's some troops, our troops, under that bridge. as this little roadway passed under the bridge. But anyway, after I, the Germans had seen me run down there, but they can't see me. So kapow, I hear a mortar bomb hit to the right of me. Kapow, another one. I thought, they're going to go right down the hedgerow. So I looked on the enemy side of the road, and I seen a German trench. So I dived across the road and got into that trench, which you're supposed to throw a grenade in, make sure it's not booby-trapped. I only had two grenades. And it wasn't until then I was able to shoot at these guys. And I'm still sights about six, 700 yards, so you can see how far they're shooting at us up on the hill. So... Uh, uh, <laughs> I get off that track again. That's okay. That's all right. You're remembering a lot of things here, Bill. Uh, you know, remembering a lot of things. Can you tell me about the German tanks? Were they the Panzers or the uh, uh, Tiger tanks? That you oh, they're a mixture. They're, they're all big. They're all big. How about the 88? That's a deadly weapon. That's a deadly thing. They're, they're, it's funny you mention that because there was a, an 88. Like when we went into the Battle of Carper K, we only got to own part of the, of the airport. Never got to own it. So, we, so you can imagine, you know, an airport, fairly flat ground. Eventually it goes to high ground and they own the high ground. You just move your nose and they got a shot. Eh? And this 188, it seemed to be so close that it's the explosion of the shell going off and hitting was simultaneous. And I'm trying to, I'm sniping around like a sniper and I'm trying to find this guy. I never did find that guy to get a shot at him. But on this trip I just come back from, there, the, there's a, an army camp has taken over that as their training quarters. And we come across this pit that an 88, and now I can look down and see where it was firing. That's the son of a gun I was looking at, but he was still maybe 500 yards away. They got very high velocity. It's originally a, a French aircraft gun. A terrific sight on it. And that sight, if you can estimate the, the speed a, a target is moving from left to right, it tells you on the sight where to aim off, how to aim off. So they're deadly. They're, oh, them 88s were wicked things. Wicked, wicked, wicked. 
How close did you get to the enemy at any time? Like we are, or were they always far away? You personally? Well, uh, as, as I say, uh, uh, I, I know uh, just on the news where one of the snipers got medals for killing so many people. But I, I can't say I killed a lot of people with my rifle. There's one in particular I got to think about because the guy was a little stupid. And, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just an out front observing, finding targets for the artillery to get, or our own mortars. If our own mortars are within range of this target that I discovered, I'll, because I have a radio, one of them voice things attached to your neck. I can say, Jack, Jack Selly, another Brampton guy, was the sergeant of the mortar platoon. Say, Jack, I got something for you. Watch my tracer bullet, because I'm only going to fire one, because I give myself away, too. And so I show him where this target is, because he's a few hundred yards behind me. So he's watching for this tracer thing. Then he gives that range to his men. But before, I said, fire one smoke bomb. So I can see how close you are. And then I'll direct you to go east, west, north, or south so many yards, and then you can give that to your whole battery. And so that's that's how that's one of the one of the killing things that I was responsible for that I didn't do other than information. But th there's uh, another case that's up in a church, up in the top of a church. I learned never to go up on the top of a church because it's a it's a an observation post, and everybody knows that. But I got sitting up there, my, my field glasses, and I'm searching the woods. I'm going along the edge of a woods looking for somebody to shoot at. Not me, because it's a, a good farmer's field away. So I, I come across to see one tree looked kind of funny, so I put my glasses down. I have a, also a 20 power telescope, and I set the 20 power t telescope studying this, and the tree that looks out of place is the barrel of a tiger tank sticking out. They didn't just quite camouflage the front. It's the only thing I could see. So, of course, when I studied it, I could see movement and stuff, so I, now this is an artillery shot. I'm quite a ways away from the iron mortars couldn't reach it. So I do the same thing. I contact the artillery, and I give them the map. You know, there's always two numbers at the top, of a map, most maps, and two numbers at the side. You, you pick out the square you want him to hit, and you draw it on down, you get them two numbers, and that puts them onto the square of that map. Then I have a, a plastic micro a slip of mica to lay over that map, and I divide that square into tenths. So if what I see is in the middle of that map square, I take those two numbers and I add five to point out the center. And if it's in the center this way, I'll say them to five. That tells him it's right in the center of that square. So he's, he's got the same maps as me. Fire one smoke bomb. Because they know they're being tuned in as soon as they see a smoke bomb land on top of them. Then I correct their aim, same as the, the mortars, eh? east, west, north, south. And then I correct his aim, and he gives that aim to the whole battery. I don't know how many guns is in a battery. But there were Germans and tanks flying all over the bloody place. This was only two, two or three days after D-Day. I could have stopped the bloody counterattack and put us back into the sea. So you talk about how good a sniper is. It's not his ability to kill Germans. It's the other things that he's trained to do as well, the observation. We're almost out of time, but I got to ask you a couple follow-up questions. Okay, what should Canadians remember about World War II? Well, it it, it made a better man, and most guys will tell you it made a better man. I mean, I, I was in business in the heating business, and I don't know how many how many people I helped out to make the price so they could afford it and things like that. I did a lot of things. I built rec rooms and helped people. It just made much better man out of me and I think I could say that for most anybody that asked that question too. Do you think it's important that Canadians remember about World War II? Yes. It's unfortunate that we don't we didn't pay as much attention after the war as what we are now. We're, we're people getting medals, there's people 
getting medals. I had one of the guys in my platoon just get a, a, a medal from the French government. Everybody tuned in for, they, I, had a, I got the nicest cards from ladies who weren't born when the war is. Well, could I get a picture with you? I got to have a, beat her in front of this wooden statue downstairs, down at the park. And she wants the picture. They're so appreciative. I've been to schools talking to kids. I had the Catholic organization, you know, you could buy, pay $250 for a brick to help the, finance the museum on Juno Beach. The Catholic organization give me three bricks. I could put any name on it one. I already had a brick, so I picked three of the soldiers that were there for their thanks and talking to their kids at the schools. I've, I've done quite a bit of that. Good for you. What, what does Remembrance Day mean to you? Well, that's when you think about the Buck Hawkins story and you think of all them great guys. You go through, the, I've been over many, many graves. There's hundreds of Canadian graves over there. And you look at them, 25, 26 years old is the, much, the most. There's down to some, some 17 year old, 16, 17, all dead, trying to make this a free country. And right now, we're in the process of our moving our legion into an area, and we got uh, uh, six or 12 offenders, and we're having an awful job to get possession of this new area because the people don't want us in their area. I can't believe that. The Dutch people would, I think there was a Dutch person on this gang that don't want us there. There's a Catholic uh, big organization, uh, a lot of property across the road from this place. And we, we had an interview with the Catholic people to say, would they offend it? They had nothing against us moving there. So the people just didn't want us there. And I'm sure there's, there's Dutch people over there ever heard about that. They'd all come over here with their own army. <laughs> Are you proud that you're a World War II veteran? I, I'm proud. I'm proud. I feel proud, and especially what you're doing now. I'm getting so much attention now. I'm not bragging about what I'm saying. It's just that there's very few guys like me left to tell the story. So I do feel proud in getting all this attention, and I don't mind a bit giving it out. Our young people need to learn these things. You, people, they have, they have learned it. I'm sure all the people here have learned it. You know, my, I got three boys. I don't think they knew I was in the Air Force or the Army until the first big, big do we had going back to France was their 40th anniversary. It may sound kind of silly, but do you consider yourself a hero? No. Who do you think the heroes of World War II are? Heroes are made by making a decision that come, the first thing that come to their mind. They weren't saying, well, I think I'll see if I can get a Victoria Cross today. You have no time to change your mind. Whatever comes into your mind, that first thing is what you do. And no, I, I don't feel I was need any medals for brave or anything. I just did what I was trained to do to help win the war. In fact, we had a German prisoner one time that played the accordion. I kept him with us. I kept him with us for a whole week playing music for it. He was happy and we're happy. I had the occasion when we were in Germany to stay in a house and knock on the door to see how many soldiers they can sleep. No answer, open the door, it was open. My buddy and I went in, looked around, nobody, and I heard a whimper under the bed. And I took all my weapons off and everything. I said to Chris, Take, get the hell out of here. And I looked under the bed and there's a lady and a little girl, I don't know, five, six years old, shaking like a leaf. And I, she could see I had no weapons, and I understand the word slop in this German for sleeping. So with that, uh, I got her to come out from under the bed. I had no weapons on, and we just want a place to sleep. And anyway, to make a long story short, we get into a room. They, she made up a room, the white sheets and everything, and just get, in, get only get into the white sheet bed when this knock come on the door. <sighs> this little girl comes in with an armful of flowers. It's terrible part of thing. The, the Germans are taught we're going to kill and rape, and it, we were strict orders. Be strict but fair with the German people as we go through Germany. Could I get you to give me a salute right into the camera? Um, can you use that arm or not? So whenever you're ready, I want you to look right in the camera and give me a salute. Go ahead. Great. Excellent. Stay there, Bill. <laughs>